Hello and welcome to our virtual St. Thomas Aquinas College campus. My name is Carolyn Fraker and I'm the interim director of the Justice Studies Institute here at Stack, as well as assistant professor of sociology. Today we are hosting the first of a three part series entitled Education, Decarceration and Reentry. Tonight's discussion will be hosted by my colleagues, Dr. Stacy Sewell and Dr. Ellen Chayette. Uh, I really recommend everyone turn their view uh, to speaker view so that you can see the speaker as we move between the different people who will talk tonight. And before I hand, hand the reins over, it is my pleasure to introduce our Stack College President, Ken Daly. Some of you may remember a year ago or so, almost to the day, we launched uh, the Center for Social Justice. And I believe this is exactly what was envisaged by our team. So delighted to see it uh, come together. I think everyone knows it's a three-part series. So tonight is uh, part one. I think it's gonna get better and better. So really, uh, I love it because I get a chance to listen and learn. Uh, I think my only introductory comment would be is I have just a little bit of experience in this space. Uh, when I was an adjunct 30 years ago, I gave a, a lecture and the person who heard it asked me to come into a prison, the Arthur Kill prison in Staten Island. I think I shared with Dr. Sewell uh, when we first met. And it was a life-changing experience for me. I remember at the end of the presentation, the students uh, wanted to know how they could get a job. And the answer was, yes, you could, but it was complicated. And I had to really think about how best to guide and direct them and help them. And then very proud later in life, I worked for National Grid, as many of you know. And in the United Kingdom, we had one of the world's leading programs, what was called Young Offenders, we worked with 22 prisons uh, across the United Kingdom, and uh, the reoffense rate of our participant was 7%, as opposed to, I think, in the UK, the national average was 73%. So we really felt good about you know, the work we were doing. Uh, so coming to Stack, seeing the passion, seeing the expertise by uh, people like Dr. Fraker, Dr. Shiat, Dr. Sewell, and others, but to hear today from the students themselves wow, what a learning opportunity for all of us. I can never say that I've experienced what you have, but I can learn from your experience. And as I always like to say, hopefully it'll make me a better president as we move the college forward. So Dr. Fraker, thank you for putting the program together. Really looking forward to uh, listening and learning tonight. Thank you, President Daly. And um, again, I'm handing this the reins over to uh, Stacy Sewell and Ellen Chayette, um, who will be leading us in this conversation hosting this conversation. Uh, so Ellen and Stacy, just take it away. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Stacy Sewell. I teach history at Stack. I've also um, kind of been uh, the point person at Stack for our program at Sullivan Correctional Facility, which is a maximum security men's uh, state prison um, in uh, Sullivan County, New York. And we, I say, I, I believe that Stack is really lucky, so lucky to be able to partner with Hudson Link to, um, to have this program that is a bachelor's of, um, a bachelor's of science in social science at, at the facility. And um, I just wanna give a shout out to uh, Mary, who's on here, who's also, who's our person who helps us administer, administer the program inside the facility. Um, and so I've been also really fortunate to be able to teach in that program. And tonight we have two uh, graduates of Hudson Link um, who are now, um, they're taking classes on our campus, um, Masters in Public Administration and Criminal Justice. And I'm so proud of them. And I'm really proud to be at Stack and really proud to have the celebration of our students who are there and of course can't be here. Um, our students who are now actually on our campus, it's just amazing to me. And when I found out that, that, that we had a couple of students from the facility who were coming to Stack to, to, to get a master's degree, I can't tell you. It was just for me and for our faculty, just about one of the greatest, most exciting things that has happened to us at Stack, I think. So I am going to introduce um, Jose Fitzgerald, 
who was my student only ever while he was in the facility at Sullivan Correctional, um, sat right in front of my class on, on history of, uh, of colonial and post-colonial Vietnam, always had a lot to say, always had a smile. And I just, I'm so happy that now we can have this conversation. And I, I have a lot of questions for you, but I'm gonna boil that down. But first, let me just say that Jose, you know, he, um, you know, Jose uh, was incarcerated from the age of 20. He was inside um, in the, well, in a facility in New York for 24 and a half years. And actually I was very surprised Jose because you look not a day over 30. I, I, again, <laughs> but in any case, what are you talking about? No, <laughs> I really, wow. <laughs> but, um, uh, so, uh, in any case, Jose was part of our first graduating class, Stack's first graduating class at Sullivan Correctional Facility in 2019, and he was released in 2020, and now is in the MPA program, um, and it's just astonishing to me. So, Jose, um, yeah, I, I guess I just, I don't know if we should, if I should ask you, or maybe Ellen, you want to introduce Eldridge, I think? Yeah, let me introduce Eldridge. And um, again, I, I also met Jose while he was incarcerated, um, attending that graduation, but I didn't meet Eldridge until he showed up in my office to be interviewed for the MPA program. And now I am just so proud to say that both of them are in the MPA program. And I think the true beneficiaries, um, they may think they're the beneficiaries of the program, but I think the real beneficiaries are us, the faculty, we, the faculty, um, who teach them and also the students who learn alongside them. And, um, uh, you know, it's the classroom, <laughs> I'm going to go first. Um, before I was arrested, you know, I, you know, I graduated high school, you know, my life wasn't really all that bad. I've done some, you know, what would be considered questionable things when I was before I was incarcerated, but it was never nothing really serious. Um, then again, as Dr. Sewell said, I was arrested at the age of 20, uh, sentenced to 25 to life for a homicide. And once I was incarcerated, I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to sit around, walk around the yard, play sports, play cards, just anything but education. Um, there was a couple of times that there was a couple of counselors that said that I should do correspondence courses for college, but I I didn't see that. That wasn't in my future. My future, to me, was prison. Um, eventually, I ended up taking one correspondence course, um, went into Sing Sing Correctional Facility, where I met a really, really wonderful woman. Her name was Arlene Muhammad. And I was trying to convince her because I seen a bunch of people walking around with books talking about how cool these classes were. I tried to convince her that I should be in college with them. Now, I mean, it really didn't take much convincing because she was all about seeing people who wanted to better themselves to get in. So she allowed me the opportunity to get in. Um, I enjoyed it, but I wasn't quite ready. Ended up getting in trouble. Got sent to Clinton Correctional Facility. Um, I was in Clinton for four years before I was able to come back down and go to Sullivan Correctional. Once I got to Sullivan, I had to convince another woman that I needed to get into college. This woman happened to be Miss Donnelly right down there, Mary Donnelly. It was a little harder to convince her because she was like, hey, classes are full. You know, you had an opportunity. Now you got to prove yourself, which I ended up doing. I was ended up tutoring some of the guys in math and, you know, eventually becoming her clerk, which wasn't an easy feat in itself. You know, she's got high expectations for her people. Um, while I was doing that, I ended up getting in getting my associate's degree with Eldridge right there, sitting behind me the whole time uh, from SUNY Sullivan. Um, immediately after our graduation from SUNY Sullivan, Eldridge left us 
ended up going to another facility. And that's when I met Dr. Sewell, <laughs> talking about they're going to come in in a few weeks and start teaching us in the bachelor's courses. I, I was ecstatic. Loved every minute of it. As she said, I sat in the front of the classroom. Um, I think there's another person in here somewhere, uh, Mr. Ehrenberg. Oh, wait, wait, and there's some more teachers. Got uh, Dr. Uh, Professor O'Connell. But um, so as I'm sitting in the front, I'm motivated by people like, like I said, Robert Ehrenberg and the rest of my classmates to do as best I could. Now, as far as the experience of learning inside, it was, was an easy feat. The officers in there, you know, you had a handful that actually wanted to see men succeed and to move on and to, you know, live a better life once they were released. But the majority of them weren't like that. The majority of them were, they had the mindset that, why are we paying for you to go to school? Even though their taxpaying dollars have nothing to do with me going to college. Um, they always made sure that they were harder on the guys that were trying to go to college. They made sure that the classes were almost always late. And so it's just, it was just really sad. It was a sad state that anybody would try to hinder somebody else from better in their lives. Um, me, I try to look past all of that. And by being a clerk for Hudson Link, it made things a little bit, a little bit harder because I actually had to be a face that they seen every day. Now, at the same time, I let my mouth get me in trouble sometimes because I didn't let them just speak to me any way that they can. I didn't allow them to just speak to the civilians and the professors any way they thought they could. So yeah, my cell used to get trashed a lot. Yeah, they messed up and it, you know, I held that down. I was like, hey, it's for a greater cause. And the greater cause was graduating with my bachelor's degree. And not only me, but the other men that graduated alongside with me and just to see the smiles on everybody's family's face, knowing that her loved one was actually getting a degree when at any other point, almost none of us would have gotten it. Because I, I can only speak for me. I know that I didn't want to go to college when I was home. You know, I, I joined the military just so I can stay from going back to school. I'm like, I'm not trying to learn no more. There's no reason to learn. So once I did that, and at that particular graduation, I see my youngest grandson for the very first time. So I was able to make my daughter happy, my grandson happy, and just a bunch of other people happy just by getting a better education. Now, what I've noticed about this education is it, it kind of opened up other doors for me, like arenas like this right here, where all of you get a chance to listen to what I have to say. and know that there's people inside that want to do this, that they really want to, they, they don't want to be where they're at. They want to have a better future. They want to make something of themselves, but, you know, they, they need to be afforded the opportunity. And, you know, thanks to Stack and Hudson Link and a bunch of other colleges and, you know, organizations that bring college inside, these men and women are actually having the opportunity to do that. And with that, I'm just gonna say, uh, Eldridge, it's your turn. <laughs> Sorry for ending it so abruptly, but you know, that's kind of how I think. Sorry. Thank you so much, Jose, for that, man. Uh, powerful and, and, and I, you just took me back to the classroom, right? So I'm about to get on my soapbox, but before I do that, um, Dr. Swell, Shayette, Bracker and especially you, um, President Daly, thank you for providing a platform for us to even have this discussion, right? Um, so I'll start by saying I once read somewhere that the key to change is vision, right? Looking at the incarcerated, not from the perspective of what they've done, but to connect in what's next. And I've learned through my journey while incarcerated that what's next is definitely education. 
you know, how do we improve opportunities in prison or opportunities every, anywhere, right? It, it's through education. It's the backbone of our society. Um, so Ellen, thank you for that great introduction. I might have to take you with me so you can make a, a great introduction like that for me everywhere. But um, as she mentioned, I'm the development manager at Hudson Link for Higher Education in Prison. And I always say I have the best job in the world. I raise funds for an organization that has provided me and my family with so much. So I'll begin by saying that I'm not the exception. Jose and I are not the exception, right? I always start by saying that as well. There's so much untapped potential inside those prison walls, men, women, waiting, hoping for their second chance. So we are not the exception because frankly, I hated school until I was receiving, receiving a college education that I never knew I wanted. I, I understand the difference between um, the effective and ineffective kinds of education more intimately than many. I, I understand because I received both types. I, I received a public school education that was uninspiring and, and a college education that, that literally changed my life. I went from hating school as, as an adolescent to loving it as an adult. Um, but when I finally did encounter that real education that I'm talking about, I was 15 years into my 22 year to life sentence. And I was hopeless. I'll start from the beginning. I was hopeless. I, I couldn't do 22 years to life, right? The number as a prison sentence was unfathomable, right? I, it was longer than I, I had been alive at the time I had been arrested. I couldn't do 22 years, right? I entered prison at barely 20 years old, reading at a seventh grade reading level and doing math at a sixth grade level. And I learned pr quickly that prison, like, like all environments, creates opportunities, whether it's negative or positive, as Jose touched on a little bit, it, it creates opportunities for, for incarcerated individuals to construct identities, right? And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but when you're young and uneducated in prison, your options are so few. There are actually only two options. You can go to school or get involved with different vocational programs, or you can go to the prison yard and hang out with your peers, right? And at barely 20 years old, that option was easy for me. I'm, I, I went to the prison yard and I got exactly what that prison yard had to offer, but it wasn't until I was 23 hours locked down in that prison cell in solitary confinement that I actually, as Ellen, um, Dr. Shia mentioned, I read my first book. Um, it wasn't the most profound piece of writing, right? And I'll tell you that much, but I still remember how accomplished I felt, how proud of myself I was that I finished this book. Um, it was also where my relationship with education changed. The moment that I realized that solitary confinement, like hopelessness, um, would be my reality if I didn't make a conscious effort to do something to change. Um, it was like the light turned on. There's the saying that you don't know you're sitting in the dark until someone turns on a light, right? That was me. I eventually obtained my high school diploma and I suddenly wanted to go to college. I, it, it felt like I had let so many people down my family in particular, that I, need, I needed some form of redemption and school seemed like the answer. I wanted to show my family, perhaps even myself, right, that, that I still had value. I, I, it, it took me almost 15 years to get there. But at the age of 34, I finally arrived at a facility where Hudson Link was providing college education for the, the men's sermon time there. It was Sullivan Correctional Facility. And I could not believe what I was seeing when I arrived at this facility. Um, and in my 15 years of incarceration, I've been to a number of facilities. But I want to tell you right now, this facility, the men were bringing books to the prison yard. College literally changed the dynamics of the prison. Um, now, let me explain a little bit about Sullivan Correctional Facility. It's a maximum security prison when almost 80% of the population uh, of the men are, uh, are serving indeterminate sentences. It's probable that many of these men will never be released, yet they were hopeful. Men, like I said, men were bringing books to the yard. The conversations were so different from what I remember. They were college students. I became a college student. And, and while in the classroom, I was determined, but I was also surprised that this was not how I remembered school. Sure, I, I, you can say my drive was different, but the courses I encountered were, were also complex and, and, and interesting. They seemed to put so many words, so many things I had experienced, especially in my adolescence, um, into perspective, for example, in, in my first composition class, they gave me texts uh, about peer pressure and group minds that helped me understand why I had followed the people I had in my youth, even when I knew deep down that those people were setting uh, poor examples for me. One of my first thoughts was, wow, I wish 
these are the things that my 15 and 14, my 15 and 16 year old self had known. It was paradigm shifting. I, I, I finally began to see my life and myself in a new light and education gave me that opportunity. Um, uh, so a lot of things that I struggled with, you know, in my youth or perhaps daily in prison was visible, but, but it was through Hudson Link that I was afforded this opportunity. And the most crucial thing was that nothing was free. I had to work and to think like I had never worked the thought before because my ideas were heavily scrutinized by my professors as it is now, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, my thinking was constantly being examined. My, my critical eye came alive in those years as did my ability and my need to question. And my favorite question became why, right? Why hadn't school not always been like this? I had such disdain for school in the past yet all of a sudden I was interested, intrigued. Um, I plowed through 120 credits of coursework, classes like sociology, criminology, uh, US history, uh, political science, uh, all types of math, which I personally did not get along with, um, still don't get along with, um, but I was a college student. And, and I think Jose can agree that the status, the identity of college student in prison signifies social status. And with the social status comes um, its attended expectations, the way you carry yourself. You're now expected to help others. Jose mentioned like how officers usually used to talk to professors or you know, um, and language, which is probably the most serious expectation. And, and what I found in, re in retrospect is simply the person who I was for so many years, who acted without thinking was slowly fading away. And, and, I, and I liked it. You know, this was the effective education that I spoke, up, spoke about earlier where education did not just teach me what to think, it taught me how to think and how to keep thinking for the rest of my life. So, uh, you know, I'll get off my soapbox. I think I can end there. Thank, thank you guys. I, I, what could I say? That, that was a really full, thank you both for your, your perspective on this. Um, I, I did put a question. I will, I, I will, so. Chat. We you gotta know, know. Oh, people. Yeah, oh. it was I, a I, I, book, wasn't it, Aldrich? It was most. It was, it you know, it book. was most certainly. So it was. Um. So when I was in prison, I, I was in solitary confinement on lockdown. Um. You had guys who I, I can point to Jose because Jose worked in the library for a number of years. So that you would have a guy like Jose coming around with a cart full of books. I never asked for a book. Um. I always wanted like hip hop magazines and stuff like that. So one day. Um, he came around and he was like, hey, they, they, the, the facility is no longer ordering magazines, so you're not going to get magazines. But he said, hey, I have something that you might be interested in. And I guess he's, he noticed that I was reading a particular uh, set of magazines. So he gave me a book by author Donald Goins, which is a hood book. It was called <laughs> Black Gangster. And that was my first book. It was like 200 pages, and I was so proud of myself for reading it. But um, I... I Thank you for asking that. Um, I, um, I, I don't really know how we should proceed. I guess I, you know, I know Ellen has questions. I'd like to hear about, you know, that transition from, um, you know, school inside to school outside. And of course, that's what Ellen knows better because I don't have either of you as students anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe Ellen. Well, actually, I, I'd like to just follow up on something that um, you said, Eldridge, and you also implied, Jose. So, um, and you talked about how being a stu college student in prison gave you a social status. And, you know, I've been to two graduations now in prison, and I've seen exactly what you were talking about in terms of how the families look and how, you know, young kids and nephews and nieces and grandkids and parents who were standing there saying, I never thought this was going to happen. And, but, um, and, but, but while you were there, so did, did going to college inside give you a social status among the other men who were incarcerated? Can you talk about that a little bit more, like how that worked and what that might've done for you in addition to the learning part of it? Well, you definitely look at differently while you're in there, while you're in college inside. Um, 
Hold on, having some technical difficulties with another computer that's in here. Well, until he gets back, I'll, I'll, I'll start a little bit. Yeah, so um, we are. So Jose and I, um, so it, you have a number of, of expectations now. Like I said, the way you carry yourself, um, you're a college student, so you have to be disciplinary free. So that gives you more incentive, especially when you start, uh, um, you know, getting further into your academic journey, right? Um, you, you, Jose and I were teaching. Um, Mr. Robert Ehringberg, who's also on the call, he taught. We, we we taught remedial classes that we put together for the students who are trying to, you know, take the entry exam to actually get into college. They look to us, so they'll see us in the hallway walking with our books. Like we're in the yard studying, like so that that creates a whole nother dynamic in prison, and and it's looked upon. Um, most look look up to that, and we it, it becomes encouraging for those who actually are on the fence or not considering getting into college. So now when we have these conversations with them, they're like, you know what, it, it it's not uh, it's not bad to be in college, right? It it doesn't have that, you know, um, negative connotation like that usually men in prison have so you can add on to that jose like, and yes i, I agree with eldridge 100 but i also have to add that the administration looks at you differently because now they know that you're not just some ignorant you know gang banger that's just sitting in there waiting to cause trouble and they know that they just and you're going to hear me say this a lot that they just can't say anything to you they can't expect you to believe just anything that they say to you because they know that you have a level of education that's either on par with theirs or surpasses theirs. So when they come to you, they speak to you from my experience with a little more respect. You know, they give you a little higher level of dignity than you would normally receive while you're incarcerated. And I enjoyed every bit of it because you know, I was working hard for that, you know, to be treated like a human being instead of being treated like an animal on the street. You know, so, and then what really got me is whenever I see an officer start treating me with a little respect, like, you know, that's, that's, that just took it to another level. It's like, what? Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I got you, man. <laughs> but it's, that's how, you know, we feel that you get a little prestige and it takes you up in your social standings while you're incarcerated. And many, many, many of, yeah. And I'm just gonna say many, many of the incarcerated people, uh, folks inside, you know, once they get their college degree or they're actually um, on their academic journey, uh, they, you know, a lot of them are leaders in the facility. They're creating these programs. Um, like, like I said, the conversation is so different. Like I went from here, you know, myself included talking about um, sports, you know, music and the latest trends to conversing about like social class and Karl Marx. Like this is happening in the yard, right? Uh, we're, we're developing programs like um, economic awareness and financial literacy classes for the men inside, right? So it's creating that social status like, okay, this is, we can learn something now. Like, and, and folks, are, a lot of folks are getting involved, so. And then there's also something like I like to think of as a, roach, a cockroach effect. If you see one cockroach in your house, you know there's going to be a whole bunch more somewhere in the wall. So what happens is when somebody like Eldridge or I are, you know, out there talking to people, you get more and more people that want to do what we're doing. And then there's the, a lot of the times I act really stupid. Where when, because I used to tutor DED classes and all of that. So I'll get guys to where they come up with the answers themselves. And then they're like, oh yeah, I got it. I'm like, okay, so why are you acting like you don't know this stuff? And it gives them the confidence to want to go on and on and on. So hey, listen, they can think that I'm a little slow, which sometimes I might be, but it, if it gets them to where they need to be in life, I'll be slow all day long. And as Aaron Berg would say, Jose, you fool, but still. <laughs> but it's that's that's what we were trying to accomplish to get everybody at a higher level. You know, we're not trying to bring anybody down. It's always bringing somebody up.
Eldridge, you have something to add to that? No, no, I was just, I, I, I don't know if we were going to talk about going to the transition. I was just, you know, I'm, I'm, I think Jose said, said it, said it. He, 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 I don't want to get on my soapbox because we can go on for days talking <laughs> about this particular topic. Um, um, yeah, so let's talk about the transition because both of these men are also recently returned citizens. Um, in fact, I don't remember how long it was be between the time you were released and showed up in my office, Eldridge, but Jose, I met pretty much uh, within a few days of release. Is that correct, Jose? That's absolutely correct. It was That's like correct. literally less than a week. That's what I, I remember. Was to you. <laughs> Matter of um, fact, I was talking to you and Stacy at the same time in a it, parking lot because I was coming from another meeting somewhere. That's right. And Tiana, <laughs> one of our former and Tiana students was there. Well. Yes. So, um, I mean, I, I, I think I know the answer to this, but the process by which this happens is something, again, I have not shared in your experience. So how did education inside and the kinds of things that you're both talking about developing, how did that help? I'm assuming it helped, maybe it didn't help, but how did that help you in your transition as a returned citizen, which we know even in the best of cases are, is fraught with so many issues and problems. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak about that. Well, unlike Eldridge, I used to, I loved reading as a kid. I, I've stayed reading all types of books, you know, from Dr. Seuss books while I was still like a teenager to books like The Count of Monte Cristo and stuff like that. But once I started getting my education inside, I started reading other types of books. You know, I started reading not for pleasure anymore, but for actual knowledge. So, you know, bringing, using that to transition back out into the world, back out into society, it helped me to do that because now I had the, the actual tools that I needed. I knew, I knew where to look for certain things. I knew how to ask for certain things, which that's something that a lot of men don't know how to do because they don't know how to properly word something or where to properly look for it at. Um, again, and I came out right on the height of COVID. So it made things a little bit easier for me. My transition, I'm not gonna say that it was super easy because you know there's still some things going on, like it's up here, but it made it a lot easier, you know? And I feel that the education that I received taught me how to handle like what, a couple of people inside would say real world problems a whole lot easier for me, you know. Um, again, it was, you know, about problem solving. There's certain things when you have to write a 16 page paper and there's a few professors in here that know that I wait till the last minute to write those papers. Uh, so you got a 16 page paper to write and it's due tomorrow. How do you solve this problem? Do A, you not do the paper, get an F, or B, drink a lot of coffee and stay up all night and buckle down and read all the books. And a lot of times I chose B. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it definitely helped me with my problem solving skills, my communication skills, and just overall my thirst for more and more knowledge. And I get to meet more exciting people because I realized that professors are really like daredevils just throwing that out there <laughs> and Jose does wait to last minute this is this has been an ongoing thing since inside he waits for last minute and the, it, this man is just brilliant because he can write a paper overnight and still get an A things that will take me days so um definitely uh I envy you for that um so my transition to society and onto a St. Thomas campus, you know, college campus setting. Um, and it was eight months after my release, Ellen, when I actually met with you, it was right, it, it was right bef before COVID, it was in February of 2020. And, um, but, you know, my, my transition is still, to, to St. Thomas Aquinas is still one of, if not the most monumental moment since my release two and a half years ago. Um, it is because I believe of my, my experiences that I understand 
the need for, for you know for change you know to our criminal justice system and and that's why i do the work i do at hudson link and and especially why i enrolled in this incredible college program this masters of public administration and criminal justice program um the rough ride I, I I had taken through both school and life made them made the importance of my newfound passion for education that that much more significant, right? Um, as I now prepare to write my capstone paper, right? And as you can imagine, it's on higher education in prison. Um, I came to understand how my personal troubles and the flaws of the public education system had had intersected. I spent most of my two years in this MPA program. Um, taking courses like financial accounting, where I learned the principles and practices used to prepare like financial accounting information for reporting, right? Um, administrative law, um, Jose, when, Jose and I loved that class. We were like going, bumping heads a lot, but it's where I gained an understanding of, of the role that government agencies and, and public administrators play in the American government. I just completed my, my statistics course um, which was insufferable, but um, it was a challenge. It was a huge challenge, but I gained a stronger, a really good understanding on how, you know, to portray data and 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 numerical and, and graphical format, how to calculate, read, and interpret basic basic statistics. It was so, and it's it's been instrumental in my career in the private sector right now, and I will never forget uh, my my very first MPA course was in the summer of 2020 um, and was evaluation and evidence-based research. Did I get that right, um, Dr. Shayat? And there were two students in the class. I, I shared this story before and I, and I love to share it because this is you know, my introduction to, to this graduate program. There were two students in a class, um, my classmates who were going into the police academy um, during the course of that class, right? And this was at the height of George Floyd, right? This is the summer of 2020, the beginning of COVID and where there was such a divide between law enforcement and, 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 and you know, and society and the people in the communities. And I was, I would want, I wondered to myself, why would anyone want to get into law enforcement right now, right? When there's such a divide between community and law enforcement, why would anybody want to become a part of that? And by the second or third class, I realized that my two classmates are going to be, are probably right now part of the change that we need, right? They're going, they are the leaders right now in, the, in this next generation of law enforcement who are enlightened, who understand precisely what is necessary to enact real change. Um, so now in, in the wake of my capstone, right? I, I often feel like I understand the current administration's draw towards prison reform and higher education in prison more deeply than they do especially with all these classes that I've taken. This is not to boast, but, but to say that I'm an informed citizen who can assess and engage a debate about education reform, this is something that I am honestly proud of. Witnessing in myself and in other students the academic growth necessary to complete something like a capstone is, is, is powerful and empowering, right? Like just hearing about the prospect of a senior project from the beginning of one's entrance to the college adds an aura of significance to the process. I just want to be clear about that. I mean, I was a little nervous. It made me nervous, but it also made me feel more academically capable uh, than I had ever been because my professors never questioned my ability to complete it. Ellen always told me, Dr. Scheid, I'm sorry, always told me, you're gonna do it. Don't worry about it. And it was a given to them that, that I could and would. And, and, I, and I like that. I like that a lot. It, it crossed my mind for the first time that I may actually be able to hang, hang with the big boys, right? To complete the kind of, of project that students from Ivy League schools were doing. This kind of hope is important, I think, to anyone enrolled in a graduate program, especially important for, for someone like Jose and I, who were just recently released from prison. Um, so, so yeah, that's. I think I can. My thought stops there. I also want to add that. The college campus, they, I mean, nobody there really cares that we were in prison at all. We went, like, there was a class that Ellen had one day, and I may or may not have just barged in while she was speaking to me, <laughs> Elvis and Tiana, and 
just took over her class. As I was in there taking over her class, Eldridge came in, helped me take over her class. <laughs> and, you know, the students were so enwrapped by us that they actually started quoting us in their paper. So I ended up seeing a few of those students later on, and they just kept asking me questions. And not just about prison, just regular questions. Like, like they would ask any other student on the campus. So I feel anytime that I'm on that campus, I feel extremely comfortable. I feel like, hey, I belong here. And, you know, that's something that I would like to see for everybody else that comes after LG and I. And thank, thank you guys again for giving us this opportunity to do this and experience it. Absolutely. And, and as I mentioned earlier, right, like uh, we're not the exception. You know, I, I, I concluded once um, in a talk that I had and, and, and I, I conclude that that we're we're a rule. I'm a rule. Right. Um, that's because for so long I held on to that hope and I now want to be and I'm a part of the change that I wanted to see while I was incarcerated through my academic journey. And it's still it, it's a continuum now that I'm in grad school. Right. Um, I, I still want to live in a place where people are connected to their history. Right. I mean. This is something that we'd all should want, where they think about the effects of their actions and work to improve the places they live. I mean, this is so imperative, especially today. I mean, it's a utopian goal, but only because society is structured in a way that limits access to the type of, I call it privileged education that Jose and I received. You know, my journey, my journey could have been a lot different and I understand that, but um, guys, more must be done. And the question, the question is really one of purpose, right? What is education? What is education in prison for? And what kinds of people or, or citizens we are trying to produce? If we genuinely want thoughtful people in our society, ones who can, ones who can, excuse me, make educated decisions for themselves and their communities, then the answer to what education must look like is clear. Because Jose and I are, are proof proof of the transformative power of a quality education, and we are not the exception. So. I'm just, I'm just going to say, is there any questions? I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I want to take some of the pressure off of the two doctors right here, because I know that I put a lot of pressure on them when I'm in class. So, um, is there any questions from anybody? Yeah, Jose. Hello, how are you? I just like Mr. to chime Aaron. in. That I'm sounds doing like very Mr. Well. Aaron Bird. I'm sitting here right now. I'm a little overwhelmed. I got my Chinese food all arranged here, but I'd like to know through this process. So you know, we laid a foundation through education, and we bring it back to the communities. What's your ideas, and what are you doing in the community today to make it a better setting for the rest of the people? Thank you, Mr. Ehrenberg. That was a good question. Almost sounded like it was scripted by maybe like me or something, but it definitely wasn't. <laughs> it really wasn't scripted. <laughs> um, well, right now, I am honestly into trying to trying to push education. I do I do a lot of volunteer work for Hudson Link, and because I know Hudson Link is one of the organizations that can definitely bring you know, education into the, into the facilities. Um, by, I figure by helping them out, it gives them the opportunity to save money or to help the next person. It's, it's about pushing and paying it forward. Great, uh, I wish, I'd just like to revisit one issue or discussion we had previously, and it pertains to your capstone uh, project. <laughs> You were thinking about transitional housing in the Beacon area. Can I press you on that issue and make that happen? Oh, of course. that's going to happen. That's going to happen. When I do finish my capstone, that will be a project that will be taking place. So these two guys, let me just mention that Jose and, and, and Mr. Ehrenberg, I would not have uh, gotten through the rigors of the math classes had it not been for these two men. Um, I owe my A to these two men right there who who bear who, who, who they bear with me. They, they were always there. They, you know, no matter what, I would ask a bunch of questions, and these guys were 
teaching the remedial courses and I was already in college and, and I needed to sit through these tutoring sessions because um, when it comes to like numbers and why are there letters there, this is supposed to be math. I, you know, it's, it's math and I don't get along, but well, I, I think. Eldridge, it's funny you bring that up because right now we have a conundrum. Hudson Link is going into Greenhaven and uh, I'm sure you all know Stanley Bellamy is there. That's right. Stanley Bellamy is taking the reins. Uh, I'm trying to introduce my basic math program uh, through one of the uh, facilitators that go in there, Rachel Bohr. And we run into a problem a lot of times because there's a lot of hating going on. And what I want to relate to that is inmates cannot teach courses. What's your opinion on that? I mean, uh, uh, incarcerated individuals can teach courses. I mean, we, we are the proof of that. I mean, when Mary Donnelly, who's on the call, hey, Mary, when we started the, uh, the, the pre-college, you know, the, the, the remedial classes, it was taught one time. The first time they started this process it was Stanley Bellamy and I who taught the writing and reading um, remedial classes, and it was Mr. Fitzgerald and Aaron Berg. And this is the first time that the first time we, we taught these, you know, we, we, we prepared these men for the entry exam is the first time we had 21 students prepared for the for the exam and 21 students who actually got into college they they passed the entry exam so um that should answer your question right there can incarcerated individuals teach of course they can inside the facilities should they of course i, I it goes without saying and i want to just circle back to the question you asked about like what are we doing right i mean for a little over two years now um i've worked with hudson link as the development manager like writing grants expense reports raising funds and organizing events but the best part of my job, um, so for, for, for some folks who don't know, Hudson Link coordinates college programs at six New York correctional facilities in New York State. Uh, we also provide transitional support to our students who are released, which looks like um, we, we, we provide them with business attire, casual attire, laptops. We help them set up their email accounts, resumes, um, because a lot of these men, me, myself coming home after 21 and a half years, I've never sat in front of a laptop before. I never held the phone. So it, it was through Hudson Link that I actually prepared myself. I actually got you know acclimated to a laptop. Um, so every student that walks through that door, this is the the best part of my job. And this is how I feel like besides raising the money to support the programs is once they're released. Because I always say it's much more, it's just as it's much more about the work we do inside the prisons is once our students make it out where the real work of the uh, where the real work is manifested right of the work that we do inside. So every student that walks through that door, you know, they, they all have that same look in their eye with when they come get their transition support, they have this burning desire to get their life started right. Um, Bobby, you were like the first day home, you had proposals in your hand. Jose, the same thing. Most of all of our students, once they arrive home and um, someone gave me, uh, told me when I first got home, like, hey, Eldridge, um, take your time, right? Slow down. I know you have this burning desire to get your life started, but slow down, right? Take time, take about three months, four months to unpack and get familiar. Of course I didn't listen. Two weeks home, I was working. I was, you know, I started working and I see it in every eye, every student. None of them are gonna listen to me because I give that same spiel, spiel to everyone who gets home. Um, but I feel like that's the way I, I give back to try to get them to slow down a little bit, even though they're not gonna listen. Um, in addition to, of course, um, raising money to support the programs that that's provided me and my family so much. Dr. Shyad, I see you have your hand up. Yes, it's the so, first time I you have your hand up. I can I hate. I, I know it's there. a little reversal of roles here. <laughs> um, we have a, a lot of students, I think, in the room, and you know what happened when you guys bombed my class, right? They started out quiet, and then we couldn't get them to stop. Remember? So what I'd like to do is ask the students if you have any questions. You can either put it in the chat, and one of us will read it for you, or you can ask your question, because this is a really good opportunity for non-students too. And we don't Anybody. bite. Anybody. <laughs> we don't bite. Nobody. Well, I'm, I'm gonna jump in. Um, I, I'm, I'm Bob Murray, I'm the provost at the college, and it's uh, really an honor to sit here and listen to you guys. I'm going to remember this. I know it's being recorded. Maybe I'll play it when I have a bad day and I realize that if the 
at the end of every day, we do this. We, we, we do this for people and it's, it's, an, it's just amazing. I just wanna say a couple of words and then I do have a question and I have a, a favor to ask. So first is this wouldn't be possible until about five years ago, six years ago maybe, when Ellen Shiat, Stacy Sewell, Barbara Yance walked into my office and said, I think we have a crazy idea. And I said, okay, I like, I like crazy ideas. And they said, how about we have a program that finishes the associates program in Sullivan? And I said, okay, tell me more. And long story short, this is, that's how this started. There's another woman on the call that I feel compelled to call out and that's Dr. Uh, that's sister uh, Peggy Scarano. She's a member of our board and I met the board, if you know anything about a board of trustees, they call the shots. So you met President Daly, the board is his, that's his boss. And so I knew if we wanted to get the board on this, we would have to get Sister Peggy. And Sister Peggy won the board over and I'll never forget it because she said, you, we presented the idea to the board for a vote. And she said, you know who would like this idea? Jesus. <laughs> and it was hard to argue with a nun who quotes Jesus. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, so I'm going to thank Sister Peggy. I did. <laughs> these, are the, these are the people who were behind the scenes who made this happen. And um, I couldn't be prouder. I mean, this is exactly what we wanted when we started to see this kind of thing happen. The second thing is a comment, really, when you talk about reading Donald Goins, who's nobody to be ashamed of. Donald Goins, I'm an English professor. Don't, I'll, I'll, I'll give some respect to Donald Goins. Um, but when you, Eldridge, when you told that story, it reminded me of one of the most moving things I've ever read, which is the story of Frederick Douglass learning to read uh, in the narrative. And it's so familiar what you just talked about, how that was like, so we believe, and again, to talk about Sister Peggy, we just rewrote our mission and she was part of the team that did it. And we really wanted to include my favorite phrase, because i am uh, I've been influenced by Paolo Frara, um, that education is liberation. And at the heart of what we do, is everything you guys talked about. And there's that moment when Douglas is reading and he realizes this is what people and what people are talking about. And he said the same thing that happened to him, that you happened to you guys, everybody looked at him differently because they knew they couldn't knock him down anymore. And that's what, re it's amazing that like 170 years ago, it's, it did it then and it's doing it now for people. So I just wanted to make that comment. And now I'm gonna ask a favor. So, uh, one of my jobs as provost is to meet with students who are gonna be suspended and dismissed and to, to, to work with them and to sort of counsel them and to get them back because their grades are bad. I'm gonna be perfectly honest and I know the president and a board members in the room, we don't have a strong track record right now of retaining students of color and we need voices of, from the men, from, particularly of men of color to come and talk to these guys. Mm -hmm. A lot of the guys we meet with are south from the South Bronx and I've heard more than one story. I, I bet I've heard 30 stories in my seven years of provost that go like this. Why do you need to be in college? And the kid said, because if I go home, I'm gonna be in jail or killed. I've heard that over and over and over again. And I'm gonna ask you guys a favor, if it's not imposing on you, to say something of what you just said to some of our students who struggle, because they need to see Right. that there is, that education makes a difference and that they need to open those books and they need to pay attention to literacy. They need to pay attention to these basic skills. And I think you guys are just have this amazing message and I'm gonna ask you at some point to work with me to share it with these guys. Well, I'll be honored. I have no problem, of course. Like you, you, you know, Great. call on me, I'm there. I'm definitely there. I, I was literally sleeping 20 minutes before this meeting started. I apologize, but hey, I don't care. You can wake me up in the middle of the night and say, hey, I got someone that needs to be spoken to. I might yell at them a little bit, but at the end. <laughs> no, that's fine. Message. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. But anytime you need me, I'm, I, I'll am i be there. That's not a problem. Of course. Yeah, because it's a, it's something I, I'm, we're, you know, President Daly talks about one of our main focus, uh, focal points right now is the access admissions, uh, access and affordability of, of, of a college education. Mm -hmm. And access really means taking people and changing their lives. And to have talk about your own experiences as having education, especially the one that we're privileged to provide you, uh, change your life. I think that's such the story our, our, all of our students need to hear. I'm, I'm focusing on Absolutely. who I've spoken to who struggled. Every student on campus needs to hear that message, believe me. Yeah. I can honestly say I wouldn't be where I'm at today without education. To, 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 I couldn't fathom being able to hold a conversation, let alone amongst academics right now, right? 
the way I'm holding a conversation had it not been for education, had it not been for my academic journey. Um, so I'd be, you know, it'll be my my, my privilege to, to to speak to the students, um, Dr. Murray. I'll take you up on that. Thank you. And that's all. all right. I'll back away now. I, and if I could just jump in at this point also, what Bob said, when this program was first brought to us five, six years ago at this point, I guess not only did I say Jesus would approve this, but my, my second comment was, well, why not? Isn't that, what, isn't that what Stack is all about? You know, going out and really educating that's what that's what we're all about. And Bob mentioned the new um, mission statement that we just approved this past June. And let me tell you, Eldred and uh, Jose, as I'm sitting here listening to you, you are definitely living our words. We challenge, we guide, we energize. And right now you guys are an example of the profound difference that you can make with an education. So what Bob just asked you to do, I will second that, you know, to help our students re realize the importance of an education. So I thank you. And I, I thank Stack, Stack again, you know, for taking the risk and taking the jump, you know, to bring this program to us. And I was also at the graduate, one of the graduations. And I tell you, when I sat there and I looked at the faces of the, not just the graduates, but their families. And I mean, mothers who were crying because they never thought that their son would be doing what they're doing. You know, um, so good job, guys. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say something? Of course, Mary. It wouldn't be right if you don't say something, Mary. I know. I've got. I've always got to get my mouth in there. Um, I'm going to contradict Eldridge a little, just oh, a little. It wouldn't be right if you don't. Let's That's go, Mary. Not. I'm ready. <laughs> they they are sort of a little of the exception because they both, they were so open at all times. I mean, there were times uh, they set the bar. They were the first three cohorts um, in, in Sullivan set the bar so high because they, they brought the program together. It's because of their, their hard work that the program at Sullivan is so successful. When Hudson Link met with uh, Dr. Murray and Dr. Sewell and all of the other people that were in that room, it was the middle of August and between Stacy and everybody else, we had a bachelor's program up and running in two weeks. And unfortunately, in that time frame, Eldridge got transferred. But Jose was still there. And through all of this, Jose not only got his bachelor's degree. And like he said, he was my clerk and that is not an easy thing to do. He also, I'm not an easy person to work for. And he would say to me, you know, I'm used to crazy women and I'd be like, okay. But during COVID, Jose ran that whole program. I, did, I don't know how, that program would have survived inside without his leadership. His, the things that he did for this program was amazing. So my question to both of you, morale is really low inside right now. They don't know whether we're staying, whether we're going, 
are the professors going to be there? Are they not going to be there? Is there going to be another variant? Are we going to have to go back to, they just don't know. And we're starting it. We just started a new semester. And so what advice do you two have for me to help me and any of the professors that are going inside to encourage our students to be able to find that spark again? And I'm done. I'd, 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 I'd simply tell you, ask you to tell the men. Um, so when I, before I left, Sullivan, before I was released, I was in contact with, I'm still in, I, I was in contact for a long time with guys who are in Sullivan, who are still in Sullivan, who I graduated, who graduated before me. Some of the guys who were in the remedial classes that, that I taught, who graduated with their bachelor's degree. Um, one of the things that I, that I left with them, I, I told them that, um, that I'm coming back for y'all. I'm not, I'm not gonna leave y'all behind. I'm coming back for y'all. So you can let them know that I, I kept my promise. And as long as I'm the development manager raising money to support the programs inside the facilities that we're not going anywhere, Mary. As long as I'm here raising that money, telling this compelling story, which is not necessarily, I mean, it's a true story, right? It, it's working, right? And and just share with them this speech, the, 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 the conversation that Jose and I just had on this panel for St. Thomas Aquinas College. And just let them know for me personally, as long as I'm a part of Hudson Link raising this money, which I don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon, that we are we are not going anywhere. These classes are gonna to continue to go on to just bear with us for a little while and we're there for them, not going anywhere. I like to think I left you in like great hands with Mr. McGurk. That's what I like to think. And one of the things that I used to tell them all the time is if I can do this, you can. So suck it up and move on. But that's that's just how I used to talk to them. But at the same time, I would let them know that hey, there's, there's something bigger than and just you feeling you know sad. You know, there's men in prison are competitive. They want to be the best at everything they do. Okay. And they don't want to be beat by anybody. So once you start telling them that they're going to be beat, and the person that's beating them is themselves, or you can go a little better than that and say, do you really want to see the COs win? Because that's what's going to happen if there's no more college inside of the prison. And then a lot of the men start to be like, what? Are you crazy? They might curse Gary out. They might. But Gary has to hold that down like I did and just, you know, think about what it's doing for the men. Because eventually they start to, you know, process this and they, they're not going to try to lose because nobody wants to be a loser. Nobody. And these men will start to pick up. You know, again, I had the way that I used to handle a lot of the men in there was really unorthodox. But I loved every last one of them, even though they all drove me crazy. And Mary, I know you heard me numerous times in that office, like just venting and, you know, sitting at the computer, you know, using some few choice words to an inanimate object and all of that stuff. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it is what it is. Matter of fact, Robert was down in the office a few times when I was doing those things. But what it all boils down to is you got to let them know that this is for this is for the better. And not just for the better for somebody else, for the better for them. And they'll start, they'll start to pick up. Absolutely. I think there were a couple of hands up um, uh, that I saw. Yes, I actually wanted to jump in. I know we've technically gone past 730, which does not surprise me one bit that we're past our technical end time. But um, I really wanted to uh, encourage some of our students. I know there's students out there who have questions. It can be kind of intimidating on Zoom 
to like put yourself up there on the screen, especially when we have so many non-students on the call as well. Um, so I wanted to give space for a stack student to ask a question. And if no one speaks up, I'm just gonna give silent. We have to give silence for a second to let someone volunteer. And I know too, like uh, one student, so Shania, if you're okay with me calling on you, uh, she sent me a message in, in, in our messaging service here within Zoom. And I know you've got a great one. So Shania, if you're okay uh, coming on screen, I'd, I'd love to like give you a chance to ask your question directly. Hello, just give me one second. Go ahead, take your time. Hello, can you see me and hear me perfectly fine? Okay, yes. hi. So have either of you returned to your communities and I'm sorry, have either of you returned to your communities in an effort to make change? And if so, how are you received? Uh, well, technically I didn't return back to my community because I'm from New Jersey and um, I was arrested in Orange County. Um, they sent me to Newburgh when I first went back home for two weeks. And um, I really didn't like it too much because it felt almost like I was going back to North. And, you know, that's where all the troubles were happening for me. Um, when, when I first got home, it was about trying to better myself first because I can't, you can't help somebody else if you're, you know, if you're down and you're not doing well. So the first month or two was about fixing myself. But at the same time, I started school literally a couple of weeks after I came home. So with that, I was, you know, in the classroom, I was doing whatever I could to help the students out. Now, I don't know how many of those students came from urban environments like I have, but you know, I know that they were getting the best of me in that classroom. So by getting the best of me, you know, hopefully they learned something and they were able to get, you know, do the best for themselves. Yeah, that, it, that that's a great question, Shania, um, especially since um, growing up um, in relatively lower class neighborhood, right? Um, the projects, you know, amongst, you know, your peers, you know, doing mischievous things, right? Like committing crimes as a youth. Um, you go away for, I, I went away for such a long time, you know, um, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it, it was ner it, it's nerve wracking, right? And, and it, it, it's, a, it's a level of nervousness when you, when you're coming home. Fortunately, I did not return to the same community that I left 21 and a half years ago. Um, but just to assume, right, that oh, the the guys who you left so many years ago, they 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 don't know that the, the college educated Eldridge. None of them know that. They just know the person that left, right? So to go back, um, it's it's it, it was a level of nervousness that I can't really articulate. But I'll just tell you that um, I did go back, and um, to my surprise, I was received with open arms. Um, I, I still have family who live down there, but how I've given back, um, because I raise money, I, I connect with foundations, um, you know, who provide us with, a, a, you know, financial support. There are a number of programs that, that, that weren't around when I was, when I was a kid, that's, you know, helping the youth in these neighborhoods that where I grew up at and, and whatever organization that I see is at the forefront of trying to keep, the, you know, keep the kids off the street for making the same mistakes that I've made. Um, the way I've given back is, you know, finding the foundations that closely align with their mission and what they're trying to accomplish. And, and I, I network, I connect with them and, I, and, and hopefully they can receive the funding that's needed. So, you know, the next Eldridge growing up in those streets, they don't make the same decisions I made when, as a youth. Um, but that a great question, like, again, like, for so many men and women are incarcerated individual, you know, returning home after such a long period of time when they have this 
this image, they created this legacy when they were a kid in the streets and then going away, getting college educated, coming home, um, a completely different person while the, the people you left, I, I've literally seen men doing the same exact thing that they were doing 21 and a half years ago when I left. It's unfathomable to, to believe, to, to, to imagine that, right? Um, and of course they look at me like, okay, like this, he, he, maybe he's, they're trying to, fill, they'll fill you out to see if you're the same person. So, and once you have the first conversation with them, it's, it'll be, it's clear to them that you're not. So, um, and if they're not about the change that, that I hope to see in the neighborhood, I, you know, you have to lead them. And that's exactly what I did and just help the organizations that's trying to assist the youth and, and the communities. Great question, I thank you. Thank you guys for responding. I appreciate it. You're welcome, not a problem. Can I just add to that for a second? Because not only there's two ways of paying it forward and one way are to the communities that these men came from, but the other way is to the students who they sit in class with on our college campus. And as um, I don't remember, it was Eldridge or both Eldridge and Jose have sat in class with future police officers, future correction officers who have gotten to know these men as human beings. And by extension, they have to rethink what they thought about people who have committed crime, right? They have to think of, of people as people. And I, I firsthand have witnessed that change, right? In some of the dialogues that our students have had with you. And hopefully by what they do in their careers, they'll also interact with at-risk populations in a different way so that maybe we won't have that same kind of kind of cycle perpetuating. So I think that's also a way that you guys have made a difference significantly. Thank you so much. And I also like to argue, not argue, but debate, especially when someone's coming from a different perspective. So of course, um, I tried to be less impulsive and more of a critical thinker, especially when we're having a conversation. I remember one in particular, um, when we were talking about, I think it was prison. Oh, I think maybe it was your class. Oh, I think it was, what was the class, Jose, that we were in um, with the professor who's a, he's a captain at the- Oh, church. ethics. It was the ethics class. Ethics, ethics. And it was great. And he was showing a bunch of films with like officers. And of course, I'm going to like, we're going to have a conversation about this. And and I, and I would be like, how about this? Like, instead of like asking whether anyone should be locked up or go free, why don't we think, think about like why we solve problems by repeating the kind of behavior that brought us the problem in the first place, right? Why as a society, we would choose to model cruelty and vengeance, right? Like you have a, you know, a, a, which again, law, I'm all for, no one likes crime. I don't like crime, right? You know, so, but I just say even, and even those in the, who, who are, our criminal justice system considers the worst. What I'm trying to say is you will see human stories, right? And most, if, if, most if not all will contain childhood trauma, victimization, poverty, loss, right? All, which all ultimately led to a seat in a courtroom. So as, as opposed, like whoever, you know, um, controls the media controls the narrative. And that's, that was, oh, that's always my conversation. So when you hear the media and the people like, oh, but you watch the news, you see that. Um, I forgot where I heard this from. They said, um, if you read the newspaper, if you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you read the newspaper, you're misinformed, right? And this is exactly what's going on. And, and I cannot, under my watch, allow anyone to create a narrative around me, especially with my lived experience, without at least pushing back a little bit. I'm going to push back on all my professors, which I've had throughout my entire academic, academic journey. So yeah, that was. Not only did we study with future police officers or correction officers, we studied under police officers. And for some reason, the two in particular, you know, Professor Promisell and uh, what was his name? Professor, we just had him. How do I finish his Anger name? Meyer. Anger, Anger Meyer. Anger Meyer. He was great. He, he was, was great. He was great. Coolest dude on the planet. And it was like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to go as hard as I think I can go because I can't go nowhere with you. <laughs> you know? It's not, I can't, I can't debate. When you're, you know, you're talking, you know, facts. There's no debate in facts. But um, I've realized that from looking at the other perspective, the other side, that 
you know, I understand where they're they're coming from now. You know, not just, you know, hey, look, you're a police officer, you know, you're doing this, that makes you bad. No, no, I see the problems that they have to go through to do their jobs, you know. Um, and the debate that Eldridge was really talking about was between me and him, whether prison yes. should be abolished or whether they shouldn't be, because we both have completely polarized views of whether prison should be abolished. You know, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> that's him That's him poking to try to get me to start talking more about this conversation. But yeah, it's been a, a great journey and Agamai has been one of the, one of my favorites. All of you, all of you professors are my favorite. Let me not just say that because I have Tracy Tully, Dr. Tully next. So yeah, I'm sure you're gonna be my favorite. I could tell you <laughs> my favorite favorite. And Barbara Zico, thank you so much. I see you. Thank you for the shout out, Barbara Zico. <laughs> so I was ascending prior to college. Um, prior to my college academic journey, like I, 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 as I mentioned, I was in a facility for almost 13 years that had no college, uh, you know, didn't provide any college courses inside the facility. Um, I'm happy to announce that today, uh, uh, Hudson Lake High Education is inside the facility at Shawanga Correctional Facility, the facility I'm speaking of. Um, I wish they were there. I would have probably started my academic journey a long time ago, but prior to my academic journey, as I mentioned, I was ascending and it was through an organization, a, a, a program called Prisoners for Higher Education in Prison. And Ms. Barbara Zico was uh, one of the service providers at, you know, at the PACE for the PACE program inside. And it was like the start of my academic journey after I was released from solitary confinement and some of the guys, you know, as I started working in the law library and learning a little bit more, it was it was through that program. So I just wanted to give you a quick shout out, Barbara. Never forget. So I, I did receive one last question that I think is actually a good one to uh, from a student to kind of work towards wrapping us up here as we approach eight o'clock. Um, but one of my students, Shia, she's a, a student here at Stack. Her camera isn't working, so I'm going to read it. Um, she asked uh, that she's curious about if and how students at Stack, other students at Stack, can be supportive and kind of pay it forward or help or figure out a way to kind of help uh, do the work that you guys are doing so well, but even just as students who are just now learning about um the the challenges around education and incarceration and kind of coming to the the stack campus i'd say get involved tell them what you just heard like spread the word on what you just said you know um like i can't stress enough the transformative power of the college you know of, of a college education while incarcerated right you know um the, the possibilities are endless. Like I'm telling you, we're not the exception. If you can just get the word out there right now and just tell folks like, hey, it's not only, it, it, you know, it's looking at the incarcerated, not from the perspective of what they've done, but to connect in what's next. Tell them that. And what's next is education and just let them know like they're, we are not the exception. I know Mary, I'm gonna have to say it again, but we are not the exception. There's so much untapped potential behind those prison walls. These folks are hoping, waiting for their second chance. And once they get their second chance, I, I can tell you right now, most of these students, most of these men are at the forefront of civic engagement. They're giving back, they will help building the communities they once took part in destroying right now. We have students who've been nominated for Emmys. You know, we have students who, 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 are, who are running for Senate, like they're practicing attorneys in law school right now. Um, this. You know, I don't know. You want to add something, Jose? Yeah, um, I say get them while they're young. Start talking to the youth out there, and you get you get them before they go to prison. That's how that's how you stop all of this from happening. If you prevent a person from going to prison, then we won't have to have these talks anymore. So start talking to them while they're in junior high school, while they're in high school. And you let them know that, hey, this isn't a path that you should be taking. And then you right. explain to them why. And like Eldridge said, if you have to use our stories, then go ahead and use them. I don't, I don't care. You know, I'm, I'm telling you 
so they can prevent somebody else from facing what I faced. And also, you, know, you can go. Oh, go ahead. I was, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say you can go to, to the Hudson Link for Higher Education website. You can see uh, a, a number of like videos, um, impact uh, uh, stories. You can see a number, like you, you'll see a couple of our stories. We have like a, a, a virtual gala coming up. Join that, speak about it, just get involved, whatever you can do um, just to get involved with this, you know, because the power of education, even in the darkest places is real. It's happening. Exactly, once, once, you, once you open up somebody's eyes, you can never close them again. I see Mr. A Adrian's uh, hand is up. Can I speak? Yep. Yeah, we, we hear you. We hear you. Uh... Uh, hi, everybody. I'm I'm Adrian. I'm a um, formerly incarcerated student as well. So um, my, I think what one of my professors used to do was allow her high school students to read papers because they were too young to actually come meet us. So they learned us through our essays. Mm. So and, right. and that's when they that's when they really saw like the untapped potential. They saw the writing. It's like, oh, this is this is deep. These are these are people that we toss to the side. But if you read the essays, you feel the the remorse. You feel the pain. You see the education. So that's how they learned us before they got twenty one. They had to be twenty one to come inside. Then they started coming in as tutors and assistants, and that's how they learned got into the system. So start with the essays. Let them hear the stories. Mr. Griffin is a really, really close friend of mine. Thank you for that, uh, for, for, for that, Adrian. You're welcome, Eldridge. <laughs> well, I think we've probably, um, I mean, I know, I know Jose and Eldridge, I know they can literally talk probably for the next few hours, but um, we've... <laughs> I know too. And I know, in fact, Jose was really interested to talk a little bit about kind of policy around, you know, some criminal justice issues. <laughs> Not now. No, but that's the next love... panel. That's the next panel. Right? Exactly. I, so I don't want to like end this and say, okay, you're done. You're, oh, no, we, but... we need to hear more about like the, some of the substantive, substantive issues that are out there. And from our stack uh, alumni and uh, few, you know, future alumni and uh, anyway, yeah, Ellen, please, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I got to hear more. Soon. No, I agree with that was not an interruption. That's exactly right. I was going to say we're ending it for right now. But this is a conversation that I, I'd like to say we were just beginning. But of course, we've been having it for quite a few years. And I'm just hoping that you will continue to take us up on our offer to come speak with us, speak to our students. Um, uh, again, helping out um, with students who are having problems in college. And, um, you know, I, I personally thank you both for everything that you bring to our graduate program and to our campus. So thank you. And thank you for this so much. Anytime. Thank I, you. Thank you. I for, told for, you anytime you guys need us, we'll be there. No. Of course. Of course. Thank you for, for the, uh, giving us a platform to even talk about this, to get this, the, the word out, right? About, Thank you for um, letting me talk without somebody saying, "Hey, shut up, Jose." Hey, you know, I'm sure people. I'm sure people were saying that on this call, but they just didn't verbalize it out loud. Oh, I'm just kidding. But um, yes, thank you just for this platform in itself, just allowing us this opportunity to talk and and embracing us like with open arms. At, uh, you know, exactly. Whether it's virtual or on campus, that's some. You know, while in while in in the classroom while incarcerated, like that, there was a a sense of humanity. That we were we were provided we don't usually get that right um but while while in the classroom we were college students you know and and now released um despite you know what society may be you know may, may label us like you know uh, a felon or what you guys still embraced us continue to embrace us as students as humans and that humanity component means the world to me and i just want to See, I can't, you know, I would love to extend the level of gratitude that I frankly am unable to articulate. So I will just simply say thank you to all of you guys. Eldridge, Eldridge and Jose, thank you for an overwhelming experience. And Anytime, I, Robert. You're welcome. Anytime, Robert. Anything for you, buddy. 
I have to jump in with all the, the the passing around of love here that we're doing. There's just thank you so much, both Jose and Eldridge. I honestly, at six o'clock this evening, I was exhausted. And all of a sudden, I feel inspired to like stay up till two reading books. Like, I just want to. <laughs> Donald Goins, Donald Goins. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where this energy came from. Um, but like, really, just so inspirational. And I mean, just the way you talk about education and a love of education for the purity that it is, is just, I don't know, it just spoke to my heart. Um, and, and to everyone else, thank you so much for coming to this event. And I have to do a little plug that we've got two more great panels coming in yes. later in the semester in March and April. And I am putting the RSVP link um, in the chat so that you can pull it up and read about the, the future panels. It'd be great to see everyone back again for both of those talks. And we can just continue this and, uh, it and, and definitely bring both of you guys back again. Thank you so much, Dr. Frega. And also I wanna mention that every one of you guys are invited to our virtual gala that's taking place May 13th. I will send a link to all the professors May 12th. Who, who, it's May 12th, by the way. Oh wow, I can't believe I have I the that. secretary right here. All right, May 12th. 12th. Thank you so much, uh Deb. Deborah, okay. um, so May 12th, virtual six to nine. Um, everyone is invited. Please just register. It's free. Donating is optional. I had to mention that because I'm the development manager, so I had to mention <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, please join us. I mean, if you think these stories, I mean, I'm glad you guys are inspired by these stories, but there's gonna be a whole lot where that came from. Just you know, um I, I, I want to personally invite you all. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Have a good night.